people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. favorite games word association with jessica mccaskill all right we're gonna throw some names at you you describe them with one word one sentence whatever you feel like your first one sanisa estrada she's dope amanda serrano uh late katie what? taylor wait 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 what are you talking about late you gotta explain that one. Oh, I, I don't know i feel like i feel like you know i mean true she she got the the big money fight and that was dope and everything but you know, she she was late on the draw to knock Katie out. She she was late on the fight because she was, you know, picking over the money and everything. And, you know, she she might have been able to do more damage, you know, before uh, when, when this whole fight was supposed to happen. And then remember that? That was like, wow. Yeah, but if she had not waited for that, she wouldn't have got the big money. You talking about $800,000 $800, less. But if she would have won... <laughs> Then what kind of money is she working with, right? Man, then, that's then a everything gamble, Jessica. That's, that. a, that's a crazy gamble. That's an eight hundred thousand dollar gamble. I agree. Some people fight for legacy. Some people fight for money. Some people fight for belts. And there's oh, nothing. Don't make it sound like that. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Why you go that low? Uh, Katie Taylor, scared. Katie Taylor. I'll help you out. That's where you. Oh, why did oh. I know you was gonna say that word, scared? I knew wow, it. God. Wow. Okay. Yeah, Mc Michaela Mayer. Uh. Unimpressive, unimproving. Um, Alicia Alicia Baumgartner. Up and coming. Clarissa Shields. Uh, waiting. <laughs> Savannah Marshall. Uh, beast, yeah. Oh, beast. wow. So maybe you might have two friends at the end of this uh, <laughs> show right here. All right, that's okay. Word Association. Whether or not you agree with Jessica McCaskill's evaluation, her assessment of some of her contemporaries, she being one of the best pound for pound fighters in the sport. If you know anything about her resume and you know anything about the people she's fought, how much she's accomplished in such a short amount of time, a unified champion at 140 pounds, a current reigning undisputed champion at 147, you'll know that whether you like it or not, she's one of the best in the sport. Whether you agree with what she said or not, we know that Michaela Mayer didn't agree. Michaela Mayer caught wind of these comments from Jessica McCaskill and stated, I have more technique in my left pinky than McNoskill has in her entire body, and we can test it. Clearing out 130 in 2022, 135 in 2023, 140 in 2024, and 147 pounds in 2025, retiring in 2026. Well, I wouldn't imagine that Michaela took kindly to what Jessica had to say about her. Or Amanda Serrano or Katie Taylor, who's actually already swapped punches with Jessica McCaskill many years ago. Jessica says Katie's scared. Even if I myself don't agree with that assessment, don't agree with that evaluation, one thing's for sure. Jessica McCaskill's not here to make nice. She's not here to make friends. This almost feels like a clever bit of marketing. I don't know if that's what this was intended to be. I don't know if that's what that was. But those comments from Jessica McCaskill could end up setting the stage for some very interesting fights, interesting situations moving forward, provided she actually makes it past Alma Ibarra in her next fight. Chantel, if you're watching this, I'd love to give you a proper fight. Africa, where we begin all that. Did she say Chantel? Sounded like it. Chantel, if you're watching this, I'd love to give you a proper fight. I'm gonna come down to 140. You don't have to worry about worrying. We've known for some time now that Team McCaskill has intentions of moving down in weight beyond this upcoming Alma Ibarra title defense. They wish to return to the 140 pound division. And apparently they've got Chantel Kamran in their crosshairs. That's an excellent fucking fight. Rick Ramos states again, this will be the best performance of Jessica's career, referencing the upcoming Alma Ibarra title defense, which is set to go down in a little over a week's time on the undercard of Bam Rodriguez 
versus Soar Rungvisai. I've got a lot of thoughts on this. In reference to Jessica's comments about Michaela Mayer and Amanda Serrano, Katie Taylor, what have you, the truth is that even if you don't agree with what Jessica had to say about these fighters, what she had to say about these fighters is good for the sport. How boring! would things be if everybody made it a point to play nice and play it safe, only say nice things about their contemporaries and nice things about each other. That'd be pretty fucking boring. It would. It seems to me that it's Jessica McCaskill's intention to make waves and create ripples, get people talking, and... Shake shit up and ruffle some feathers. No, I don't think for a second Katie Taylor's afraid of Jessica McCaskill. She's already dealt with her once before. Voluntarily, I might add, she was never obligated to get give Jessica a title shot, but she did anyway, because that's who she is. That's the kind of fighter that she is. So I don't actually agree with everything Jessica said, although I like... I like that she's not beating around the bush, and I like that she doesn't have any hair on her tongue. I like the idea that Jessica McCaskill may descend from 147 to 140 pounds, returning to the super lightweight division for a potential Chantel Kimran fight. In a nutshell, I may not agree with everything Jessica said, but I like what she's doing. Kicking ass, taking names, talking shit. Talking shit. Sack business. What do you want she should do? Send everybody a fucking fruit basket? Jessica McCaskill has displayed more than once that when she says something, she means it. She means business. And she's targeting Katie Taylor. She's targeting Chantel Kimran. She has to make it past Alma Ibarra to stay in the running for those fights. And let's see if she does. In other news, Floyd Mayweather Jr. had this to say. He says, Tank is with us forever. I love Tank. We have a great relationship. Tank is with them forever? Well, I'm not surprised to hear it. Mayweather emphasized after announcing his next exhibition that his relationship with Davis is strong and that the undefeated knockout artist will continue his professional partnership with Mayweather Promotions. Leonard Ellerby, Mayweather Promotions CEO, stated during a post-fight press conference following Davis's most recent victory, May 28th at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, that the company remains Davis's promotion. I'm not here to talk about Tank, said Mayweather, who referenced Davis by his nickname. He's a hell of a fighter. He's with us forever. I like Tank. I love Tank. He loves me. We have a great relationship, and we're happy. Seems like all that stuff about Davis leaving Mayweather promotions was bullshit. It was Javante Davis's own comments that led to widespread speculation that he may be leaving Mayweather promotions in the very near future. I myself emphasize that I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't expect much of anything to change, and what we might be looking at is a clever marketing strategy in order to draw attention to a fight that's a tough sell. Because how the hell else were you going to get attention for that thing? Mayweather stated, we always want to stay positive, you know? The media is always asking negative questions, so we're not talking about anything negative. We're talking about things that are positive. Tank, I love you. We talk every day. Keep up the great work and... I'm proud of you. I entertained several different scenarios when Tank said that this would be the final fight under his existing contract. And one of them was that this might all just be a marketing strategy to sell a fight that's a tough sell. A fight that has no real sizzle, no real appeal, because Roly Romero is not a fighter that a lot of people are high on. Maybe they're high on his trash talk, but they're not actually high on his boxing. 27-year-old Gervonta Davis sparked speculation when he indicated on social media during the promotion of his grudge match with Roly Romero that it would be his last fight with Mayweather Promotions two months before Davis defeated Romero. Mayweather, when asked about Davis possibly parting ways with his company, told Fight Hype during an interview posted to its YouTube channel, nothing lasts forever. By fight night, however, Davis praised the company that has promoted him for most of his nine-year professional career and helped build the Baltimore native into one of boxing's most consistently successful gate attractions in the United States. Mayweather usually makes poor fashion choices. Usually sits ringside and yells instructions and words of encouragement towards Davis during his fights. But the undefeated five-division champion didn't attend the Davis versus Romero card due to what Ellerby said was a family emergency. Nevertheless, the popular Davis is by far Mayweather Promotions' most marketable boxer. Yeah, I think that goes without saying. He's really all they've got. We must acknowledge that to some degree, Gervonta Davis is a draw. No, he's nowhere near a draw as a Canelo Alvarez or a Floyd Mayweather Jr., for that matter. But he can draw better 
than most lightweights and super lightweights. The powerful Southpaw's victory over Rolly Romero was the main event of another Showtime pay-per-view event. Helped draw a capacity crowd of 18,970,000 people to the Barclays Center. That was the largest audience and highest grossing boxing card at that venue since Barclays Center began staging boxing shows in October of 2012. I've always thought that both Floyd and Leonard exaggerate about how big a name Javante is. I've always thought they embellish numbers and exaggerate about how many pay-per-view buys he actually sells. I've always thought that there's a lot of hyperbole, a lot of smoke, and a lot of mirrors when it comes to Javante Davis's drawing power. It's not that he can't draw. He can draw. He can draw, but he can only draw so much with the guys you're matching him against. He's been on pay-per-view four times, and he has yet to crack 300,000 buys with any one of those pay-per-view appearances. For a perspective, 300,000 buys. Canelo did that with no-namers like Liam Smith and Arislandi Lara. For perspective, Gervonta Davis's very best numbers just so happen to be Canelo Alvarez's worst numbers. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. Not based on the reports. Leonard Ellerby and Floyd Mayweather believe that Gervonta Davis hails the moon and the stars because he can consistently sell a little over 200,000 pay-per-view buys. But he always falls just short of the mark when it comes to selling 300,000 and 300,000. Canelo Alvarez can sell 300,000 pay-per-view buys on his worst day. So if Gervonta Davis is some kind of a star, He's not a big one. Not yet. He's been on pay-per-view four times. He still hasn't cracked 300,000 pay-per-view buys. I don't want to hear any fucking excuses about it because it's not like it can't be done. It has been done in recent memory. Late last year when Canelo Alvarez fought on the same platform that Gervonta Davis fights. The Showtime platform. And he sold a little over 800,000 pay-per-view buys with a little-known super middleweight that goes by the name Caleb Plant. That's saying that if you can't crack 300,000 pay-per-view buys, it's because you're not that big a star. Not if you can't hit that number. Canelo Alvarez did well in excess of that with a little-known super middleweight that goes by the name Caleb Plant. Because that's what stars and star power... Well, that's how it works. There's two many world champions in the sport of boxing. We had Roley, who was the WBA champion. No, he wasn't. We had, at lightweight, we had Tank. That was the WBA champion. No, he wasn't. At lightweight, we had Devin Haney, was the WBC champion at lightweight. And then Kimboso, who fought Devin Haney, had the WBC, the WBA, the WBO, and the IBF. George Kimbosos had the full version of the WBA title. Once again, there's two many champions at these different weight classes. Well, I've got a solution and tell Javante to drop his version of the WBA title. Problem solved. And the reason why is because they said, well, why is there so many champions? Well, let me tell you guys what goes on in the sport of boxing that they're not telling you. Every time a fighter fight, he pays a sanction fee. A champion fight, he pays a sanction fee. If they got three champions or four champions, they get money from all four of those champions when they should only be getting collected money from one champion. Yet we know. What we don't understand is why your fighter is paying sanctioning fees for a baby belt, a secondary title. It's not a such thing as an interim champion. You got guys walking around carrying belts and people think they're champions and they're not really champions. You mean your guys, right? They basically handing out belts. Yeah, to your fighters. When I was fighting, you had to really earn it. What we're doing is we're watering the sport down. Your fighters, two of them, are the ones watering the sport down. Roley was the interim champion. Javante was the regular champion. The only real champion was George Kambosos, who lost his WBA title to Devin Haney. Everybody is champion now. We have to clean the sport of boxing up. There's too many champions at these weight classes. This isn't the first time that Floyd Mayweather Jr. has said this. He very recently took to complaining about how many champions and how many belts there are in the sport of boxing at the announcement of his upcoming exhibition match in Japan. And you'll notice that these announcements and their timing is rather strategic. He chooses now, now, to start harping about how many belts there are at a time when Devine Haney has collected all the belts 
in the lightweight division. All the belts at 135 pounds. We don't need to be confused about the man to beat at 135 pounds. The guy with all the brass, all the belts, is Devin Haney. And Haney, if Floyd Haney, really has Haney. some aversion to the proliferation of alphabet titles watering down the sport, he's talking about his own fighters. He's talking about his own guy, Roly Romero. He's talking about his own guy, Javante Davis. Those are the guys. Why don't he just tell Javante to drop that belt so he don't have to pay sanctioning fees for it? I'll tell you why. Why? It's why? because he can't why? build Javante why? Davis his fight says world title fights if he drops that title if he drops that belt that baby belt that secondary title what floyd is doing now is attempting to diminish belittle and berate the significance of holding all those alphabet titles ask yourself a question if floyd really feels this way then why is his fighter holding on to a secondary title a secondary belt according to floyd according to leonard Javante Davis is the best thing smoking at 135 pounds. He's the biggest name anywhere at or around those weights. So, in theory, he shouldn't need a WBA baby belt to sell a fight. Not according to you guys. And yet he still has one. And the reason for this is because they want to give off the appearance that Javante Davis is some kind of a champion. They want people to believe that he is competing at that level, when in reality, what he's holding... That's not the full version of the WBA title. Devin Haney is holding the full version of the WBA title. Devin, who won it from George. George, who won it from Teofimo. Teofimo, who won it from Loma. And Loma, who won it from Linares. That's the lineage of the full WBA title. And you'll notice that neither Roly Romero or Javante Davis even come into it. They're not going to, because it was never Mayweather Promotion's intention to have Javante challenge real champion. Vasil Lomachenko for the WBA title. It's not his intention now to match him against Devine Haney. That proliferation of baby belts services Mayweather Promotions more than anyone else. Floyd Mayweather just said that Javante Davis is with Mayweather Promotions forever. That their relationship is great. That's the same Floyd Floyd Mayweather that said that they're keeping everything in-house. In-house when it comes to his fighter. His fighter, Javante Davis. Well, the solo Machenko wasn't in his house and Devin Haney isn't there now. So what does that tell you about those fights with those fighters? Tell me it's not going to fucking happen. That's what it tells me. And that's what I've been telling all of you here on this channel for year after year after year as Mayweather Promotions put distance between Gervonta Davis and Vasil Lomachenko, subsequently Teofimo Lopez, then George Kambosos briefly, and now it's Devin Haney. The only way Gervonta Davis fights for the full version of the WBA title is if nobody's holding it. And in the mean in between time, his handlers want him to stay in position to catch that newly vacated title by hanging on to a secondary title, a WBA baby belt, the one he's currently holding. So Mayweather's issue isn't actually the proliferation of alphabet titles in the sport. His real issue is he doesn't want his fighter to have to fight. It's not that there are too many belts or too many champions. It's that it's harder for you to keep up this illusion that Gervonta Davis is competing at that level without fighting these other belt holders and these other champions. That's what it is. There's no question who this division's champion is. It's Devin Haney. He's undisputed. It's your own fighter that has some explaining to do.